So how did you get in that cocoon or like discover that for yourself? I think that's probably the biggest driver between peace on the, the back of Gary V. I think I am driven. The reason I think I became so public in hindsight is two reasons. One, I knew that what was going to happen with social and like the internet. I feel like you did too. And like, you we know. can go back to those 2006, seven, five days. Like there was a group of people that inherently understood. Yeah. I had I this just, insight that it was like, people want to follow people, right? That was the kind of rem- impetus between behind Justin TV. I, and I'll you really took forget. it and ran with it. Oh, with I, the, I yeah. remember thinking, Oh shit, this kid, I, I, I have goosebumps. I don't know if you can see him. I remember exactly <laughs> what I thought the first yeah. day I saw it. I'm like, Oh shit. You know, I was already friends with Justine, right? Yeah. I Justine and all that. And I was like, so the Justin thing, kind of, I just remember exactly how I feel. That's why I just brought up on Justine. Big shout out to her. I was like, oh, this dude is going to live a very literal version of what I know I'm about to do in a very different version because you probably know this as well. A little bit of the difference is I keep my private life very I, I kind of, but, but it was still the same thing to me. And I remember thinking how brilliant it was. And, and, and then like as a platform, and obviously you had all the evolutions of it to your success. I, the, the answer is I think I became Gary V in a lot of ways because I was felt gratitude and guilt, both. Yeah. They were, just, they were almost even. The answer to your question is inc- impeccable parenting, ridiculously fortunate circumstance, being born in the Soviet Union, coming to America, having nothing, being in the 80s in New Jersey, which meant you spent 10 hours a day outside, luck of the draw on DNA. Then I had, you know, not only was I given the ingredients with my chemicals, but then my mother was the best chef of all time with emotional intelligence and accountability. So like, how do you build ridiculous self-esteem while not creating entitlement and delusion is fucking hard. Yeah. And my mom, and my mom did it for me. She cooked that meal. So I almost feel like, and it took me a while, probably the last three, four years, even on this one, I was like, oh shit. This is just homage to my mom. I want to do for the world what my mom did for me. My mom did this for me. People really gravitate towards my words. I have a communication style that really is unique. I can do this for the world. And, and this is awesome. Like, like being admired is so much more interesting than being uh, known. Like, like when I look at somebody looking at an athlete or a social media influencer or a model or an actor, and I see how they react to them versus how I see how people react to me. I want everybody to live my life for them. It feels incredible to be, to be, to be asked for a selfie out of the admiration that you gave them something that really has helped them versus they wish they were like you or think you're hot or like it's cool yeah. has been really incredibly rewarding. I, you know, like I it's, get that. It's nice to be admired. It's an intoxicating feeling. And the only way you could be admired is not put on a pedestal for an accomplishment is you're impacting them, not they like what you've done. It's a different level. Of, it's a different version of admiration. So anyway, how did I get there? By being incredibly fortunate that I had chemicals and parenting and circumstances that put me there and then had the... DNA to become aware of it very early on and then hone it. I, I became, in high school, I realized why is peer pressure not penetrating me? It was very weird. Mm-hmm. Just to tell you the 14, 15, 16 year old me would have conversations with him of like, why is this really not working on me? Like, why am I willing not to compromise on things for popularity? Why am I willing not to be mean? If I'm willing to be a little bit meaner and pick on kids, I could go to that next level and be at the height of popularity in high school because I was right there because of my personality, wouldn't compromise it. And that's what was needed for high school in the 90s. You need to, you need to go that next tier. You had to compromise a little bit on kindness. It wasn't cool like it is now to be sweet and warm to everybody, yeah. but I had to be that because that's who I was and that's how I was parented. Or later, even in like college, like why won't I do these drugs? Because I know that will get me this girl right now, like it, you would have these conversations with yourself of why you wouldn't compromise to peer pressure or outside validations. 
that's a really high level of self-awareness for a young person, uh, you know, to be able to have that, that conver internal conversation where you have that magnet cognitive, like analysis of why you are a certain way. And then yes. And I, it's like cool to figure out that in my forties, I'm like, fuck, I had that cool. How do I talk about it? And then in parallel to that self-awareness have a level of humility to not think you're special because of it. So the thing I'm yeah. fascinated by is how do you, how powerful to anxiety, starting back to where we are, how much humility and accountability make me happy on a daily basis? So Just how do you, I am, yeah. yeah. How do you communicate that to other people or how do you teach other that to other people? Cause you, like you said, you had all these ingredients, you know, like, and then your mom was this amazing chef. <sighs> And then a lot of people following you, you know, they might have not have started in that place, right? They might not have, um, but they're, by they're seeing, aspirational. By seeing, you know where my confidence came from? My father. Yeah. My dad was on the opposite side. And I was his son coming into a business and I spent a decade plus pounding my dad. Now, what I learned from that is just like I know that in many areas that don't come natural to me, for example, if you were like, if you asked me right now on the podcast, Gary, can you become a better singer? I'd be like, of course. I can become a dramatically better, sing better singer. I can take it seriously, mentally. I can hire a voice coach because I can afford it. I can practice every day. And in three years, I could become a much better singer. Can I become Beyonce? No. And what happened was, Justin, watching my father and then subsequently the last 20 years, 25 years, watching people that are very close to me evolve and then watching my own self evolve in an area where I really struggled, which was, believe it or not, stick with me here, candor. I'm incredibly candorous as Gary V in my content. I was incredibly visceral to conflict, which made me incredibly not candorous as Gary Vaynerchuk, the executive, which created macro entitlement in my organizations and created vulnerabilities with my direct reports that I wanted to be different about in my 40s and have gone through this incredible journey on standing up what I call kind candor, which has been yeah. a missing ingredient in my career. And in the last two years, I think a lot of things have exploded for me in a positive way professionally on the back of me starting to evolve on something that doesn't come natural to me. My mom doesn't have it either, so she didn't instill it. And thus it was a vulnerability. And I can't believe how much further down the path I am. Same with my physical health. You know, 38 and a half years of garbage around muscle gain and, but least natural thing. I have a workout later today. I'm like dreading it every day. I've worked out every day for six <laughs> yeah. years and still dread it, but fought through it. And what, yeah. what that did was give me the confidence that the kid or the grown up on the other side of that TikTok or that Facebook post or this podcast. And it's why I think I give a good interview. People are like, man, you give a really good interview. I'm like, it's because I'm desperate right now that there's one person listening to this. And I know what kind of inspiration you are to so many. So I'm imagining who's listening. And I know my name is this week's guest. So I'm imagining who's listening. And what I'm trying to do here in our 45 minutes is, can I get one person to self-reflect, to become a little more self-aware, to feel a little less scared to tell themselves the truth and then like move them, right? And so, yeah. and to me, it actually comes from the following. There's been a thing that I've been saying that's really resonating because one of the things that makes me me is I'm an anthropologist. I read comments at scale on culture. Like I've read 150 comments this morning on the Delta virus, the Delta variation of the coronavirus. I didn't read yeah. the CDC or BBC or Reuters article about it. I read 200, 150 to 250 comments and observations this morning on Twitter and Instagram and a discord on what they think, what I, I care about. What, what people's interpretations think. are. Correct. You got it. Yeah. So that's what I do for a living. So I do that with my own feedback. So something I realized that is really hit that I'm going to land right now. And I hope this helps somebody. When you realize that when you're lying to yourself and you're trying to hide something that you, if you're really good at it, you're going to trick 
98% of the losing players on earth. The other insecure. And I don't want to call them losers, but no. like other, people that are not as emotionally intelligent. One thing I've told a lot of friends when they're faking the funk, which means when you're faking it, you're anxious. Yeah. Right? You're subconsciously always waiting for the imposter syndrome to get cloaked. And what I've been trying to tell people is like, look, you're only tricking the other insecure and unhappy. You're, when you're tricking, you're actually losing with the 2% that you want to win with. Yeah. Yeah. People that, so a, that truly confident can see through that. Correct. And so there's a lot of kids doing damage to their personal brand. And by the way, all the personal brand is, is the slang term for reputation. Yeah. You know, a lot of people hate that term. And I always laugh. I'm like, what about reputation? They're like, I like that term. I'm like, good. Don't call it personal <laughs> brand anymore. This is just reputation at scale. Um, and so, yeah. So how do I think about it? I think about speaking to its truth, engaging with people, suffocating excuses, uh, trying yeah. to really, 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 I work on a lot of my people I most care about of, please, please, please don't point fingers. Please point thumbs. If you can get into mm. looking at yourself, when you feel somebody else is in control, you're super vulnerable. And when you're in the no. index finger game versus the thumb game, you're extremely vulnerable because then you don't feel in control. And when you don't feel in control, you feel helpless or manipulated. Yeah. And it's a really sad state. When you give up your agency and you're saying like, the world is happening to me instead of like, I'm control in control of my own experience. Because there's, there's uh, nothing more true to me than believing the world is how you see it. Because no. I have two very distinct sides of my family. One is grounded in cynicism and one is grounded in optimism. And that extremity, and, and by the way, extreme on both sides. I wouldn't call my, no. the optimism delusional and I wouldn't call the cynicism blind, but my family's family tree is pretty close to blind cynicism and delusional optimism. And that's, and that's how I think I became me, right? Let's I just- more than that, yeah. Um, it just, I, I have an extremely optimistic mother and an extremely cynical father. And their sides of the family played out that way too. And it just gave me a huge perspective on life. Like every situation, I could literally see the opposite. Like I live life just and why I think I'm balanced by literally seeing the world through both sides of the family's eyes. I could see every situation and be like, ah, my dad thinks that kid's going to steal. My mom's going to think that we can reconcile him. Ah, yeah. ah, ah. And so like everything I look at, there, the reason I think I've not gotten into trouble from a overextend myself and lost is I'm too practical. I see the wrong in everything. But but I choose the right in everything. I see the wrong, but I choose but, the right. 